Hey gang, Arya here. Sorry for the delay in getting this episode up. I got COVID, thankfully because I am vaxxed and boosted. It was mild, but I think my voice is still a little less smooth and sonorous than it normally is. I have a very interesting conversation for you today with Hal Doughty, who is a musician and comedian who finds sort of internet trash and repurposes it along with doing a lot of other funny, creative stuff. So the way to help Culturally Determined find a bigger audience is to leave a five-star rating, a positive review on your podcast app, share it on social media, tell your friends. You know the drill. Okay, enjoy this conversation with Hal Dottie. Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Hal Dottie. Hal, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Hal Dottie. Good to be here. Thanks for coming on. So how would you describe what you do to people who are not familiar with who you are, if that's possible? Oh, um, I mean, I generally just say that I am a comedian and performer. And then depending on like what they sort of, depending on their level of interest there, I will kind of then say, and I also, I produce podcasts and I, uh, I will start rambling off like that I have a radio show and that I do that I am a musician and I record albums and I do stuff like that. So I guess I'm a, I guess I'm a content creator. All right. I guess that's what I am. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess we sort, we all are at this point, um, you know, more or less. So I guess I, I think how I first became aware of you and your work was possibly through your Kickstarter sucks, which is a mm -hmm. very funny podcast. Um, one of my, one of my favorites. Yes, might as well. And I actually had Jesse, uh, Jesse for our JF from that show on a couple of years ago at this point, actually, maybe it's more like four or five years ago, even at this point when he I'm got sorry in to trouble. hear about that. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> he got in trouble. If you remember this incident where he um, actually, I think it involved Charlie Kirk, didn't it? He, he said yeah. something mean about someone and then or, uh, water he was a bully. Or he was a bully. He's a he's a born bully. Yeah, and, Fox uh, News. And, someone yeah. was talking about it about Fox News. It was very strange. Um, <laughs> and but yeah. So anyway, I I think they probably referenced you as writing the theme song or the interstitial music or something like that yeah. for YKS. And then at some point, I started seeing you on Twitter and followed you. And yeah, Thank you're just you, a, 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 a funny, entertaining, interesting guy. And you so you have a podcast called Fast Track. Yep. And you have a radio slash Twitch show. Yeah, that's the radio slash Twitch thing is all called Big Howl and Possum. Possum has not been on the Twitch channel for a little while. So it's mostly just mostly just me messing around on there. But uh, but Possum is still on the radio show. He's my sort of my co-host and a, a comedy writing partner. We also have a live talk show we're doing now, sort of a Tonight Show style show. OK, um, cool. The two of us together. But then, yeah, Fast Track is my thing my little project of my own that I've been doing since the beginning of 2021. And uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I've done a bunch of theme songs for YKS and for other podcasts. And part of that, I think that is part of the inspiration for Fast Track itself, which is a podcast where me and a guest write a song in a half an hour. We just sort of dream up a song in a half an hour and then I make it into a song at the end of the episode. So, yeah, so it's it's a comedy podcast and you I hope so. <laughs> you bring you bring on someone who is usually a comedian or a Twitter comedy type person yeah. and or a podcast host and you sort of riff a little bit and decide to just start writing a song and sort of work out the lyrics within 30 minutes. And so Fast Track with Hal Dotty is the name of that. And then you also have this project, I don't know what you'd call it, involving fleets. <laughs> um, which I want to talk about too, because I, maybe that was even how I found you on Twitter at some point, because that was circulating and I was sort of like, um, oh, the saga, the saga of fleets. Yeah. I was sort of obsessed with that and was so mystified by it. And it, I need, well, we'll, well, we can get to that maybe in a little bit. Yeah. But... Well, we could take a journey down the road of fleets, but I warn you, it does not get anywhere. It does not end <laughs> up anywhere. Right. Okay. Well, let's, I guess let's start with the, the music. I mean, what is you seem sort of like a musical prodigy or something because you can work at all these different styles and genres and uh no i'm i'm like i'm decent at enough things that i can fake the 
like <laughs> I can fake the in-betweens I guess is like is what it is because I'm not even like guitar is my primary instrument that I've played for the longest and I'm not even all that great of a guitarist I'm not and I'm not that great of a singer uh, I just I've been doing what I need to do to make songs for so long that I can kind of like I know how to fix enough things to get to the finished product that I'm looking for uh, okay and that's just from doing it for a very a very long time really I've been playing in bands since I was a since I was a teenager and then I started doing started doing Hal Dotty the actual like musical project Hal Dotty was just sort of a fluke thing it was the quickest song I've ever a song called fire extinguisher was the first thing I did under the moniker Hal Dotty and okay. it was a song that I just I had the idea for a song one night a song called fire extinguisher I just it literally like the idea for the song came out of me looking at a fire extinguisher and <laughs> on a wall it was a big one and i just i went home and i just wrote this sort of spoken word absurd sort of list song and i made i made a pretty rudimentary beat to go behind it and then i just went out in my backyard and i shot a video for it in like an hour and i put it up and it more than any i've never gotten this big of, i mean it's not that big of a response overall in the grand scheme of things but it's the biggest response i've immediately gotten to a piece of music i've ever written <laughs> And so that was that was sort of the birth of Hal Dottie. And then I just decided because of that, I decided, and this is funny, I've never thought about this connection to Fast Track, but I decided because of the immediacy of that, like how quick that was. At that point, I was I was in a band, I was fronting a band called Lydia Burrell. And Lydia Burrell was a project where I would like write a song and then keep re-recording the song over and over again until I felt it was perfect for like years. And that was just how I worked up until that point. Okay. Yes. Okay. With, so Lydia, then I think that must have been the name that I knew. That was my old Twitter her. Twitter account as yeah, well. It, did you like get banned Lydia or something? Is that? I got suspended for posting a clip of a parody song. <laughs> okay. I got I got uh, DMCA'd or whatever for okay, for yeah. Uh, yeah I got hit up by I I, I did have a few because they give you like five copyright strikes right and I had a few of them they were almost all I think there was one that was legitimately like I just used music in the background of a video um but the rest of them were all parody songs where the original artist sort of gave me a copyright strike for huh. a clip of a parody that i got off of youtube which so i'm not even like my, my entire account got suspended over that which is very which is very funny and i think a fitting end to <laughs> a band that started out as a real labor of artistic pursuit and like you know like i was really really trying to make good musical art with Lydia Burrell and then the Twitter account sort of over the years because of who I am devolved into me chopping up like pieces of weird normie culture from YouTube and like stealing it and putting it on my Twitter feed and that eventually <laughs> it caused the whole thing to collapse which is like a perfect ending <laughs> for that whole saga I think right well now, did you have the you were like collecting it was like really bad parody songs that like a yeah. family would do for Christmas or something. It'd be like a parody of hotline bling, but it'd be like, you know, jingle jing or something. And yeah, was that, that was your part of your, <laughs> that was, yeah, that was something that I did. I, Lydia Burrell, the Twitter account, I would do these threads where it was a given topic. It could be Thanksgiving. It could be for a while there, it was COVID parody songs right. where I, I would do, just take yeah. the funniest, I'd take the funniest like 10 or 15 seconds to me of a, like amateur parody song on YouTube. And I would just make a, I would, I would curate, you know, a, uh, a thread of them. And to me, it was, it was like, it's very, very funny to go through and see, like there, there were a ton that were about like the pumpkin spice latte at, uh, at Starbucks. And it's very funny to me to go th to see like 30 clips of 30 parody songs about, uh pumpkin spice lattes that right that and, aren't and so, and connected so these to are each not other like, in any way yeah and so these were not like professional or super popular people it's more like right more, maybe more or less regular people who think that they can make the parody songs and make them for their like their christmas cards or family yeah. get togethers or something and post them on youtube and yeah absolutely everybody believes they can do a, a parody song <laughs> and they're right they're actually the the you know the the worse they are, the sort of the better they are to me. Um, it, it has that reverse, mm -hmm. uh, that reverse quality, you know, and I, the other thing is I, I genuinely loved all of this stuff. I was not, I was not posting it to rile people up or, or, or say, look at how 
much this sucks. It, it genuinely brought me joy to like spend all day <laughs> watching YouTube videos of parody songs. But just to complete that thought about a minute ago about the start of music as Hal Dotty was um, uh, at the time, I, I decided to sort of jump in on, with the immediacy of that initial song and just do that some more. So I decided I was going to put out a song a month for as long as I could. And I made it about six months, but I still kept like, I kept doing songs really fast. Like the idea was to keep doing songs really fast. And eventually I had a, a, a mixtape and, and from that point forward, it's, this has really been the, the focus of what I have made is these kind of absurd or funny, some of them spoken words, some of them sung type of songs. Mm -hmm. How did you enter the orbit of people like JF and DB, who are the hosts of right. YKS? Were you like on the Something Awful forums or? No, no, I never was. I So I got on Twitter, I believe, in like 2011 or 2012, sometime around then. And um, immediately, I, I, I feel like it was almost immediate that I caught, I, I, I sort of picked out Michael Hale at Dog Boner. I didn't know he was Michael Hale. I didn't know anything about him. I think all I knew was Dog Boner and he had like a cartoon profile pic at that point or something. Uh, Dog Boner and, uh, and John Hendren, I believe, were like the first, the first two accounts on there that I was like, oh my God, these guys are hilarious. Like these uh, guys are really, really funny. And I think and, I- and John, I think, Hendren, John Hendren is at Fart. Yeah, at and, Fart. And Michael Hale is at Dog Boner. And I really think they must have been just retweeted by somebody that I happened to be following for some other reason or something. But I, but the, I don't remember exactly how that happened. But I, but I know I started following uh, Dog Boner. Just loved his loved his feed, and uh, and just like I guess I just became like a reply guy to to uh, Michael. And then <laughs> um, and then at some point he followed me back, and I don't know why. I really do not know why, but he followed me back. And then um, I guess we just tweeted back and forth a, a bit over the, you know, every once in a while for for a, a few years. And then at one point he was in town. He was here in, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. He was here. He uh, sent me like a DM and said, you want to hang out? And we hung out. Um, and then I think after that was when YKS started. And so I was listening to YKS from from the start. Uh, same thing with JF. I, I, I mean, I, I think I just followed him and he was funny and, I mean, I would have probably started following him through DB, but uh, mm -hmm. but it's sort of sort of a similar, you know, sort of a similar thing. Just met through through Twitter. OK, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Reply guy to content creator pipeline. Um, I guess in some way, it's sort of what I <laughs> myself. A lot of the people I've yeah. had on the show are people who like I follow them and like would reply funny stuff to them or they would right like that and then eventually you get to get to chatting so it, it is i guess sort of a a, a well-worn path at this point and what i mean it's a well-worn and sometimes embarrassing <laughs> path yeah. to have gone down uh but i don't but you know whatever the uh the traces of it are that that's the traces of it are now gone because my lydia burrell account has been suspended so uh, if I have shameless reply guy behavior in my past, I believe it is. Oh, I shouldn't be saying this. Shouldn't be saying this. Somebody's gonna figure out how to look up old, uh, old, you know, deleted reply guy tweets. <laughs> yeah, and then at DB at one point deleted a, like his whole archive. I think so. It's it's possible that all. Oh this... man, that was like that was the. I hated that so much. I can't tell you how badly. Yeah. I, I was mourning. I was mourning the loss of DB's old tweets for, for uh, <laughs> days. I, I assume some of them got screenshotted or archived somewhere. But Twitter is such a strange medium that works in all these nonsensical ways. But um, the like ephemerality of it is combined with the fact that like if some random person tweets something dumb, then they can like lose their job or their life is ruined or something, and all this is happening at the same time. And yeah, we're talking about a guy whose handle is dog boner um, and who now goes by DB because of that handle. Um, so it's, it's a yeah. very strange, strange world that has, you know, created various horrible <laughs> effects in r the real world, but has, you know, some great content um, and some funny shit has come out of this milieu as well. So they roped you into doing some <laughs> theme song work for, for that. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think what the, so the first theme song I would have, so they had a theme song that I guess didn't have didn't mention the show 
and maybe had some like sampled music in it or something. I don't remember. I, they at some point they were just like, hey, let's get a let's get a theme song going. Let's uh, they just I think tweeted that out or something. And uh, and I made one and I think they they initially had one with it from a different group, but they used mine as like the they used the first one that I sent them as like the bonus episode jingle. And um, I don't know. I just I, I really enjoyed making that. And from making that initial one, I started just sort of I think there are a couple that I made around that time that I sort of sent off to people that, you know, they didn't end up using or, or for whatever reason or whatever. I just I got sort of into the idea of making these little uh, theme songs for people. And I've I've done that a lot at this point for a lot of people. So I, I now have like like on YKS, there's a regular um, there's a update on an old Kickstarter theme that they play usually like on a, I think on a given episode, they'll usually play it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a mailbag theme that I sent into them as well, uh, where I say I I literally say their entire address <laughs> in the song. Yeah, I mean, and that's um, a great example of what you're able to do because you're conveying their literal mailing address, you know, like the P.O. box and the zip code. But you've you turned it into this. Well, what is the genre of that exactly? Sort of soulful country oh, or something? I don't, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I, that's kind of the um, yeah, vaguely country is so maybe my favorite sort of place to be in i don't know i did a um i did one that was it feels like they didn't hang on to this theme for too long but the um but the i did one main show theme called schemers and grifters that was supposed to sound like uh like dukes of hazard type music or something where i was like schemers and grifters and wanna be inventors <laughs> uh you know just like a little uh like a little adventure music that db and jf are sort of like driving around like you know busting up these schemers I, 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 I that was very fun to me and then it's funny so that this might actually seg us into fast track pretty well because i did the theme that is currently the theme for yks and it was the first song i recorded on my new rig and i, I say new but it's i've had it for over a year now but it's like the pc that i got for all of the editing work and streaming and all that other stuff that i'm doing so I, I have this theme on there now that that their theme at the beginning of the show right now is I don't know what you would call it, but it's a it's a country. It's another one of these sort of pseudo country songs, but it's kind of like this. It's in this world that's like vaguely 80s sort of synthy pop country, like that weird period in the 80s <laughs> where like there were a lot of sort of country guys on the pop charts. Um, and I, I really liked that vibe. Uh, I really liked the vibe of the of the theme song right now. And I, I based the song sort of around that great uh, Donald Trump tweet. The um, I'll still keep drinking that garbage that he tweeted at the Diet Coca Cola because yeah. they because they don't like him. <laughs> this company doesn't like me personally, but that's OK. I'll still keep drinking that garbage. Yeah. And that seemed like a very funny. Um, it seemed like a very funny analogy to draw from the show itself, which is a, a guy's like talking about shit that sucks all the time <laughs> right um and uh i really liked the vibe of this song and i was like well what if i do a whole album that sounds like the vibe of that song so it has the sort of country it, it, like i'm i'm sort of singing in that tone of voice and it has the sort of country soundscapes but then also like a little synth like bubbling in the background so i decided to make an album really fast uh, and I made this album called Smells Like Love that I did in like, I mean, the whole thing probably took me roughly a month, but that was writing, recording, mixing, mastering the whole thing. And um, and I put it out on Bandcamp when I did one of those Bandcamp Friday things where they don't take their cut of the revenue or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I dropped it like before Valentine's Day on a Bandcamp Friday. And uh, and I realized after doing that album, I was like, wow, I. I, d I don't think the finished product sounds the way that I sort of thought it was going to. Like, I, like I didn't quite get it. the whole thing doesn't sound like what I was saying, but music sort of has a way of telling you what it wants to be, in my opinion. So it's like uh, so I ended up with a with sort of another sort of vaguely country album called Smells Like Love that I recorded. And I realized finishing that album and putting it out, I realized that I sort of had the resources and the ability to put together pretty much any type of song that I wanted to. Now, I've always been like a very 
I've always been a very sort of utilitarian, I guess, producer, I would say. Like I, everything I had done before that, was recorded on a laptop with one microphone. So all my <laughs> all my previous albums are all done on a laptop, mixed on a laptop, recorded on a laptop with a single microphone. And it's very like, it's, it's just, I was doing whatever I had to do to make something that sounded a, sort of like what it needed to sound like. And I realized that I now had the, uh, I now had the ability to make bigger sounding songs and songs that sound more legitimate, I guess. And so I decided uh, that I would like to try collaborating with a bunch of people. That's where Fast Track came from. I was also unemployed at the time. I had been laid off. <laughs> and so I had all this, I had all this time. And so I thought, what a great way to spend all of 2021, you know, writing a song every week and spending all of my time doing that every, <laughs> every week. Uh, so that's where Fast Track came from. It was actually sort of born out of, in a, in a circuitous way, it was born out of uh, writing a theme for YKS that turned into an album. Okay, that is an interesting journey for that <laughs> that podcast. And oh, so I hope so. I hope so because <laughs> it was about fifteen minutes of me just talking. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, inspiration is is kind of mysterious where artistic inspiration where it comes from. Um, so going back a little bit, when you were learning about music as a younger person and yeah. getting into it, was the comedy angle like? always an interest of yours or at one point did you want to be like a serious rock star or maybe you still want to be a serious rock star like were you into oh Weird man Al? i would love you know? oh man i would love to be a serious rock star and it would be so funny it would be so funny if i became a serious rock star at this at this moment in my life uh no no i the i mean it always would have been the dream for me to have a serious musical thing that took off like that, yes, absolutely. That would I would have loved that. But I, but I was always like, I would say I was always as interested in comedy as I was. Well, I wasn't as committed to comedy, but I was always as interested in comedy as I was in in music. Um, mm -hmm. Like I've been doing, I've been doing podcasts forever, and I've been, I would say the, I didn't, I didn't do stand up. I didn't do stand up before I started doing the comedy music. But I did, I, I used to write sketches all the time. We used to make, uh, my friends and I used to make sort of like funny sketch videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that has always been something I've been interested in. And, and it really, it, when I started doing videos for the Hal Dotty songs, it really sort of made sense. Like the, the times that I'd been writing sketches and stuff, like that all sort of, it all sort of added up, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this ability to mimic or embody different genres and you i guess you're saying it's only at a superficial level but like it is i don't know it seems pretty convincing to me the, th the things you do like on, on your show you'll bring someone on and you know you say what genre do you want to do and they'll name something and it might be kind of like a weird made-up genre or something like right. so i was just i was listening to the one you did with eric rahill and his genre was something like poolside at the club um yeah yeah like an outdoor party in the summertime type yeah. of vibe yeah so um, I, I mean that seems unusual to me but may or, or but you seem to downplay it i mean that just that ability to sort of like take any genre and do something yeah it. Well, i mean i've made i've actually i have actually made enough beats to where i sort of know i can listen to a song because he had an example song which was helpful <laughs> but it was that um took a pill in Ibiza right, right. or Ibiza or yeah. whichever way he said that he wanted to do a song sort of like that and so my starting point of course was I was like okay what are the elements of that song and then from that point I was able to like make a I I do always start with something that is a rough sound alike and then I have to and then of course I have to figure out like the song itself comes through the fact that we didn't write lyrics that are, we didn't write a parody. We wrote separate lyrics and we mm -hmm. wrote and the melody is going to obviously be different. So it doesn't end up, it doesn't end up being a direct sound alike or a direct uh, like rip off, I guess. But I sort of start with, I'm trying to emulate certain elements of the song and then, and then I try to make it its own thing. Right. But I also like, I, I guess I, at this point, I just sort of, I know where to look for, because I think for that I needed to find some synth tones or some or some percussion sounds. Oh, I know what it was. I hadn't played around a whole lot with sampling someone's voice 
where you do that thing where you sort of auto tune and you play the keyboard and it mm-hmm. changes the pitch of their voice. There's a lot of that in the in the song he had mentioned. And so I I put a little chunk of the song where it's very funny because mine is very is, is it does not sound pro or legit at all. It sounds very goofy, but it's like he just uh, he goes Whoa! and uh, and it's all done on the on the keyboard. So once you once you sort of figure out the mechanics of it, you can replicate it in some form that a layperson would be like, yeah, this sounds like this other thing. I mean, it's just like I've, uh, yeah. done, I've done sort of like written satire and parody over the years, like at the humor magazine college, you know, we did like a onion style fake news and that, that's a very popular style to right. write parody in and something. And so you're sticking to the, you know, um, taking a well-worn genre and you know, sticking to it in certain ways in order to make, make a silly joke. And it, like but doing it in music, it seems like insanely more complicated to me than doing it in language or whatever, where. Well, it's... well, it is. And it's very impressive. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, you know what? I just, I, I gotta say, I just work very, I work very hard at it. And that's, right. a, I mean, that's, but, a, cause like, who else? that's a joke, but it's also true. I do work, I do work, very, <laughs> I do work very hard. At well, it. it's, it's sort of like, I mean, this Weird Al's stuff that, was not the direct parodies where you do more like a genre parody or something is maybe sort of yeah yeah similar but like not that many other people are do, do that sort of thing um yeah because it doesn't i i'll tell you what because as a generally speaking as content goes it doesn't do it doesn't do very well <laughs> well i guess that might be part of it um uh, it does it really doesn't like uh the you know the holder nesses they i mean they're they should be i think they should be a, a household name by now but they're this okay uh, now i'm only vaguely aware of who these people are but it's a well, performing just, they family just won, right yeah well they just won the amazing race they just uh oh, you know, okay like they, maybe that was why they came they're now me. they're now I, I mean they they're now as famous as anybody they're now the kardashians <laughs> but i've known them for years through their parody songs on mm-hmm. youtube and they're, you know, it's a classic story of, of modern life. It's a classic story of what happens to people when they become content creators, because it was like, it's a couple of just sort of regular ass normie parents in some suburb in North Carolina. And I think the dad was like a morning weather guy or, so, or something. And the, and the wife was, I don't know what the wife's job was, but she happened to also be an aspiring actress with a, with a reel. And they did like a, they did like a Christmas card. They did a musical Christmas card. That was a, I think a parody. I think the first one was a parody song or maybe it was, a, maybe actually that was, a, maybe Christmas jammies was an original song. I don't know. <laughs> if that's true, it goes against my whole thesis here, but, but basically they took off so much that now that's their, they're an industry of themselves. Just like a YouTube, they have a YouTube channel and they do all this stuff. They do vlogs, they do parody songs and they're just content creators now. Yes, they're these like, ho- very wholesome looking. They yeah. look like catalog models, I guess. The entire family. oh, they're beautiful. They're beautiful people. And um, so he quit his job in in corporate media and became his own sort of uh, a, sort of corporation, and now records these incredibly over auto tuned parody songs in his little attic nook. But he does he does sound alike or not sound? I, I guess sound alike is not the right the the kind of song you're talking about the Weird Al type song calls it a genre parody yeah genre parody yeah he does genre parodies as well and they do not do as well if he can put the name of another artist in the title of the youtube video it does better and Mm -hmm. you know everybody who's hustling over there knows that if you can put the name of another artist in your video it does better yeah and i I guess that makes sense i mean the the most famous weird al songs at least the ones that come immediately to mind are you know amish paradise and eat it and the other direct parodies of of huge hits so but his genre parodies are very good and he's like <laughs> uh, and he's a good songwriter when he's writing his own stuff so you know there's a truly truly something to be learned about culture just in that just in the relationship between those two things you know what i mean he's clearly a skilled and thoughtful songwriter and he demonstrates it in ways that n- nobody cares about <laughs> I mean, I guess okay, his fans yeah. his fans care about. It. I'm exaggerating that, but you know. Okay, yeah. I, I so I, I see what you're saying that doing a Thanksgiving themed Weird Al style song about whatever is a, like a top forty hit from the past year or something that everyone sort of knows because they've heard it on the radio or a commercial or something that more has more viral potential. <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, and 
something that is original, but is sort of like playing around with the various, <laughs> various, you know, genre conventions or. Right. Maybe this is sort of a transition to the stuff of the fleets. And you, probably, you, yeah. <laughs> because I feel like you included some of that in your fleets. Okay. So, fleets, for people who are not on Twitter, well, God, God bless you. And, but also, yeah. Twitter had a, um, it, it wanted to copy what like Snapchat started and what Instagram stole from Snapchat of right. a, a post that would delete after a certain amount of time, I guess, usually 24 hours. And so they called it fleets and it seemed like, a, like they basically stole exactly what Instagram was doing with Instagram stories, which I guess. No idea. No idea what the thought process was behind calling it fleets, but I'm so glad they did. Cause I well, love, well, I guess I, I mean, it runs with now. tweets and it flies away. I flees away. I don't know. Fleeting. That's it. Oh, fleeting. Okay. <laughs> Can you there believe you I've never thought about that? <laughs> I've never once been like oh it's because it's fleeting it's fleeting oh so my it would, god it would auto it would auto delete after a day or something like that oh my god and what a breakthrough you couldn't retweet it right yeah you, and that was that was truly the appeal to me was uh, i i love i loved that i loved that it was a i loved that it was a it was you were putting this stuff in the ground and it couldn't take off on its own because that was that was kind of the the drag to me about posting like so what we're talking about is sort of uh sharing found content which is a funny thing with the fleets because a lot of what i was sharing was like hugely popular stuff that if you go to just any other social media site it has 48 million views or something you know but just putting something in there and instead of so with the with clips of say like a a bad quote from some conservative politician or pundit or with the parody songs or with stuff like that, when anything like that takes off, you end up just sort of contributing to this media cycle that you don't necessarily want to be a part of. You just want to like enjoy this video or put or put it up and be like, look how funny this is. And you want people to go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's funny or whatever. But it ends up being quote tweeted and recycled and posted by other people under other you know contexts and everyone puts their spin on it. And you're sort of furthering this huge dragon or snake or whatever out out into the and and a lot of times it's stuff that we don't actually want to think about we just can't stop thinking about you know <laughs> um and the great thing about fleets the thing one of the things that i liked about it immediately was that i could take these like weird to me weird videos that i quote unquote found again these are very popular videos you can find anywhere very easily but the, these videos that i that i was obsessed with watching I could upload them to my to my fleets when the fleet bar was up there and people would watch them, but they couldn't like do anything about it. And that I love. <laughs> I love the fact that it would just like that was the end of it mm -hmm. right there, you know? OK, so and, oh, that's really interesting. So you're, it's removing, you know, it seems like with a lot of apps, there's some like initial idea and then they keep on adding more and more options for what you yeah. do. Like you couldn't originally retweet like that was sort of like right. users figured out this way of doing like RT and then right. copy and pasting what someone previously had. Like the, there was no retweet button for years on Twitter. And so, you know, they keep on giving you more and more options. I mean, it's it's wild with all the shit that they say about how they want to foster like good conversations and uh, and discourage bullying and discourage talking shit to people and stuff. With all the stuff they say about that, it is amazing they have not gotten rid of quote retweets because you <laughs> don't have to have them. They don't yes. have to be on there. Yeah, that did, I remember when they brought that in. Like, there was just regular retweets, and then they brought in quote retweets, which is sort of the, yeah. for people who aren't on Twitter, sort of the way that you dunk on someone or make fun of someone's stupid post is you quote retweet them and say, like, make a joke about them or say, look look at look at this dumb shit. And there's nothing they can do about it. Like, they're be they're, your, your best option once you've been quote retweeted is to delete the original post, which you right. might, there are loads of reasons why you might not want to do that. But it's very funny because that is the that is the one feature of Twitter that is still unique to that site over other sites. And it is absolutely the one that is used the most for saying, look at this shithead over here. And that's like what Twitter's for is look at this shithead. Yes. And it's so it, it's interesting. Yeah. Another side note, like I remember at some point, Twitter, like Jack Dorsey or someone at Twitter said, like, point of twitter is to like foster great conversations or something like that and i was just like well either 
I mean, are they stupid? Are they lying to themselves? Are they just lying to us? Like, do they not know? How, just the, they seem the people who work there just don't seem to understand the way that their product is actually used. Like, I think I, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg it's, it's understands weird. how Facebook is used and and doesn't care that it's like often used for nefarious ends or just to rot the brains of old people or something. But like at Twitter, they generally don't seem to understand how like anyone that's not just a casual user actually uses the service. It's, it's very strange. Jack Dorsey is a is an absolutely incredible figure. Like he's so weird. He's so weird to me because he, I mean, he's not, he's not the CEO anymore. Yeah, but while he, he was, away. yeah. When he was, the guy was making like $6 billion a year running that company. And his job, from what I could tell, was like sleeping on a big stone slab and waking up and being and tweeting out like, does anybody have any ideas for ways that we could, uh, you know, normalize, I don't know, a, 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 a cohesive vision for respecting one another on here? <laughs> and I'm like, this is, I'm sorry, you're just asking everybody if they know how to make your site better and you don't you you don't offer any like ideas as to how you would do that yourself he like didn't have any thoughts himself on how to make the site better not that he not that they would have been good and not that they that they should have done them you know anything that twitter does to try to change the site is generally pretty bad i thought yeah. fleets was great and i'll and i'll <laughs> just say so fleets fleets comes along okay so the fact that I'm, you can't you can't retweet it you can't directly comment on it you can send someone a direct message if i recall but yeah, you couldn't reply to it. You couldn't retweet it. I guess people would screenshot them and then sort of make a sort of like janky looking thing where you would like layer comments on top. But it was mostly, yeah, it was sort of like- <laughs> That was almost every other fleet that was up there for me was, <laughs> was one of those kind things of where it was experience. like- Where it was like refleet or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, so for me, it was like, it was this opportunity to do a shared watch where I would post a video and I had become very obsessed at this point with the sort of uncanny weird art form that the normies over on uh, Facebook watch were doing to game the algorithm over there. The al that Facebook algorithm has created this insane, just universe of characters and figures and styles of video that before the pandemic and before fleets, I had already become kind of like obsessed with this weird world because yes. it was a bunch of people. It was a bunch of people in McMansions doing sort of doing sort of staged pranks or odd challenges where the video was weirdly long because the Facebook algorithm wants your video to be over three minutes long. And then they also, they couldn't, you're not allowed to be explicitly sexual. So it had, so there would be sexual in ways where nobody was ever talking about it or it wasn't directly sexual. So it wasn't, I mean, there are videos on there that are like, that are people talking about sex. But the ones that are really trying to game the algorithm are ones where it's like a situation where something becomes sexual, but it's not. It's like a, a, a staged video where uh, someone's getting strip searched or something like that. That's the kind of video that people try to make to game the algorithm. OK, yeah. So this was one of I mean, there were a couple aspects of these things that you found and you would. So you would clip them in ways that sort of was a sort of like mashing up, remixing various things. And then sometimes it was sort of like. It's kind of like you were making like a remix music video or something out of various parts, but just the things themselves. Sometimes, sometimes I would change the like the I would I would abbreviate things or like and you make would, an ending or you would show or the end just to, I assume to fuck with us that we don't know. Well, no, a lot of times that was how they are. A lot of times that's how they that's how they are. Okay, that's so, the so other thing about these. Try to describe as I I'm probably conflating various things, but it would be something like like the, it kind of seemed like porn, but there was no obviously no yeah. nudity but also yeah. no like actual um, like it's sort of like chased porn or something. There were like porn that you like Mormons would make or people who have never had sex would make this porn or something or robots would make it. It was so all, all of these are great descriptions of it. Yeah. I mean, and so there'd be something really where it's like it a woman is like realizes that like her bathing suit, like the strap on her bathing suit tore and then like her friend and they're both like attractive, like 30 year old women. And then her friend is like, wait, I have this banana and I'll show yeah. you how you can make something out of it. And then they're like at the kitchen, like the island in their kitchen. And they're sort of like mashing stuff together. And it's like, look, and then in the end, it's like, look, it turned green or something like it, it was this strange, like 
a very oh. very uncanny but also extremely normal like like the like everything is very mundane it's a lot of stuff where oh, it was like you know there's up. it's I... stuff with bags of chips and <laughs> uh and like basic products there are a ton of them that take place just in the aisles at walmart but yeah the that's a great description that that would be a good one the one that you just the one that you just said <laughs> yeah, so it, off, it often had to do with yeah something with food or cooking or turning something into something else or well that's that's the thing color. is because the algorithm also rewards you if it's a video that you don't have to speak english to watch okay so you can't get too the thing is you can't get too complicated because and and it's really helpful if it's something that is sort of an everyday universal idea so bananas are in all of them <laughs> because bananas are everywhere right and you don't have to speak english to know what a banana is or to have a relationship with a banana so it's like yeah the the facebook algorithm wants wants you to create the and this is the, it's a combination of what people are drawn to and what the thing is tr sort of pushing people towards so it doesn't want you to be watching a sexy video but you want to watch a sexy video so the combination of those two things and the fact that it has to be three minutes long means that the ideal video is like a woman like taking off her underwear and like cleaning it with a banana peel or something like that and then putting it back on and because that's not explicitly sexual but it is horny and then it involves a banana which is something anybody could go out and get and so a lot of people are going to interact with it like should i do this with a banana like you know or people are going to go that was a huge waste of my time and they'll still it doesn't matter what the reaction is that's the other thing about the facebook algorithm it doesn't matter they put weird things in the background. They say things wrong. Sometimes on recent ones, they will outright forget to edit out like director's commentary. So the so it'll be like a stage scene, but you'll hear the director being like, now ask him this, 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 or whatever. And they leave stuff in. They don't care. They do not care about the quality of it because that just means more people will comment. More people will go, I heard that. I know this is fake. I heard the director. Like that's, that's what they're going for is the uh is just the engagement so because the engagement more engagement indicates to the algorithm that something is it's good about want to engage with this and so it pushes it up somehow yeah it's i mean it's a very weird like uh it i guess the description that i use on the fleet because i now do it as a stream i now do it as a as a twitch stream which is unideal because because it doesn't disappear after 24 hours <laughs> like you can still go back and watch these and I'm also like, if I put it on my Twitch stream, which is monetized, I'm also like, technically I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't You're make any money. I don't make any somehow. money on Twitch, but I am, I am part of, I am, yes, I am part of the system by doing mm -hmm. it that way. My description of it that I use in the, like that I have a little bot that, that prompts the description of it. And it calls it like the uncanny normie world of Facebook algorithm generated content. So it's like, there's an uncanny quality to it because people are trying to be so people are trying to ride this very specific narrow line you know okay so this is yeah it's interesting to hear this explanation as like because when you were doing it it was sort of mysterious i i figured that a lot of stuff was from facebook but it yeah. was like where exactly is this coming from and why does it exist <laughs> and what are they trying to do I get some of it from Instagram. I get I get a I get the occasional stuff from like TikTok and things like that. Okay. It's basically just anything that sort of uh anything that is funny and weird to me is like is is fodder for it really. Like I put Holderness stuff in there as well. <laughs> right. And yeah, I I've talked about this on the show before, but sort of an interest of mine is how like culture and technology interact in all sorts of ways. And one way is that like a technology will be established and then the culture sort of shapes its way around it. And yeah. especially when there's an algorithm that is promoting, you know, popularity of certain things, people sort of figure out what the thing that the algorithm promotes that other people want. So an example would be on YouTube. They seem to like when there's a man like holding his mouth open, like he's sh really shocked about something and it's like the soy face or something. That yeah, like the, th to, the thumbnail, the uh... yeah, in the in the thumbnail image, and this somehow seems it's sort it's a joke at this point, but it seems to um catch people's eye or something, and then the out. So it's sort of like there's yeah. this totally opaque set of like rules, like written in an alien language, and like humans are sort of like edging around like with blindfolded, trying to figure out somehow like cracking the code, and then somehow some weird thing like cracks some aspect of it, and so I, one of the final videos I did 
when this was a video show on YouTube, I was talking about this with uh, this guy, Doug Lane, because we were talking about how some of his content got taken down from YouTube and he couldn't quite figure out why. I, as a joke, I did the, the face on camera. And then as a further joke, the screenshot was me doing that face. And that right. video did significantly better than oh, I'm sure than the other ones. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Because I no, that stuff I did the works. Fix. That stuff works. And you know, it's a it's a funny thing about I, I think about this all the time because there there's kind of there's now I think now people the kind of stuff that I was posting to fleets like when when right when I started doing it, uh, I think that there hadn't been quite as many of by now everyone has seen these these people like the, everybody knows who like rick lax is and you i mean well you say everybody but i i don't and i assume some of our listeners don't either so who is okay well yeah i was i was about to say like it sounded very funny coming out of my mouth that everybody knows who rick lax is but he's he, so he's a vegas area comedian who essentially like created this community of magicians and their families and, the, and their friends to create viral content and pretty much anytime there's a video that come that goes viral that's like a woman drinking a milkshake out of the toilet or someone making nachos on their kitchen counter or that lady who had a fake cat on a plane. Anytime there's any video like that that blows up on like Twitter, it's usually related to him in some way. Huh, okay. Um, like the plane thing, there was yes, essentially- I he, remember that, yes. He, re he like rented a prop, or not prop, but like he rented a set that was a plane. And all of the, this entire community of like, 40 or 50 content creators from all over the country came to this plane on the same day and they all shot seemingly thousands of viral videos or, or of attempted viral videos on this plane of different pranks different things that cat video and so for weeks and so for people who missed it the video weeks, the video was like a, a woman appears to be in a seated on an airplane and she has like a it looks like she's cradling a child or something in her yeah. arms and then the guy who's filming is like freaking out and he's like, is that a cat? Is that a cat? And then it turns you out that you have it, a cat. Yeah. It's just an obviously stuffed cat. Right. Yeah. And it, it did have a, I, I don't know. I can't remember if I was quite fooled by it exactly, but it, it was not as obviously fake as many like fake viral videos are. It had this weird sheen of possibly reality to us. I guess they're skilled, you know, putting these things together. Well, yeah. And that's the thing is that, uh... They are, they are really, they are genuinely, so there was a, I think that people started becoming aware of, of these videos uh, as they started to get, as, as every once in a while, one of them would, would go viral. And so something that you hear from people a lot when one of these videos blows up on, on Twitter, for instance, again, I'm doing this as well, but it, part of the cycle of these videos is that they blow up on Facebook, somebody clips some, or, or, or on TikTok, a lot of, I think the cat video actually came from TikTok, but They'll blow up on Facebook or TikTok and then somebody will clip it and they'll post it on Twitter and they'll put a quote tweet on it. That's like, what the fuck's up with white people or whatever? You know, they'll say they'll say something in their caption like that. And and then it'll it'll blow up. And then you hear from a lot of people like people who know what it is saying, oh, these you know, these people are just trolling. They're just doing this to get your attention. And that is true on on the one hand, that is true. On the other hand, I feel like it is a slightly different thing than trolling to me and maybe i just have a more romantic view of what a good troll is or something <laughs> like that but like the the idea that this is all just some big prank or troll or almost like a almost like a normie version of like what jackass is doing or something like that like these people are doing stunts mm -hmm. for attention and the idea is like we're all falling for it and and it's only when it gets posted to twitter that anybody falls for it i think that's a that's sort of a something that I keep seeing people say about these types of videos. And it's very funny to me because in some ways that's truer than just by then believing that it's real, but it's also, it's also a different kind of um, it's a different kind of not quite, not quite getting it because so for me, these, these videos are different than a true stunt or prank or troll because it is, it is literally these people's jobs and they would do whatever it took to just get a few more clicks, get a few more views. And if if Facebook tomorrow was like, you can no longer monetize your bad cat lady on a plane video, you can no longer monetize these if you don't actually have a, sh a blue shirt on with the Facebook logo on it. If, the, if Facebook said that tomorrow, all of these people would immediately start wearing Facebook shirts. So in that sense, it is not like the art 
of trolling. It is purely a job for them, right? That is it, it, everything they are doing is to further their career as this type of content creator. Okay, so the the pure troll sort of trolls for the love of trolling. I think so. I think so. Or for the lulls. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't quite. I guess my, I haven't thought. <laughs> I've thought about the about this more than some people. I think, but yeah, I haven't I mean, thought. No, about, I, I haven't. I haven't quite put it all together. But the troll yeah, but the, as a uh, cultural figure is more and more important. I mean, w- one such troll became president. So, yes, like, yeah. that's we need to like understand this figure who's gaining more. If you know, well, influence. and there's. And there's lots of different ways to talk about like like one thing right right wingers love to think of themselves as trolls while they are caring a great deal about something which is very funny to me because i for me a troll is someone who's just in the service of chaos you know <laughs> right. uh, so so if you're if you care a great deal about something you it's a little bit weird to me to just sort of see yourself as a as a nasty little troll or whatever the um <laughs> But the uh, the other thing about uh, about these videos that people clip and then they go viral on Twitter for like a second time is the context is not changed in that. That's another thing I, I, I keep seeing people posit about these videos is that there's something sort of natural and organic and good about these being made for TikTok and Facebook. And then it's only when it gets posted to Twitter that it becomes like this out of context, you know, uh, crazy pylon or out, I guess uh, that, that it gets like an outrage cycle when it comes to Twitter. That's the idea that a lot of people have in their heads. And as someone who looks for these videos every day and tries to find them <laughs> and picks through them, that is, no, they are there. It's actually backwards from that. The people on Facebook making these videos are emulating that quote tweet outrage cycle from the start they are trying to do that from the start even if the video features the person whose account it is in it they will post the video completely out of context clipped at the start and the end so you don't know anything about the person in it and the caption on it will be like can you believe she did that something like that (laughs) Mm -hmm. they are trying as hard as they can to get these to look like someone posting a weird video they found Mm -hmm. and saying look at these idiots that's what they want that's what they actually want and that is all that anybody that's the funny thing about it is that when it then gets shared to other sites that's just they're just doing the same thing again you know i mean truly that seems to work that is a way to get views on your thing is to is to make it look like it's just something that you found right right and so hmm, this is interesting okay one what is so people who are putting this together, how does one monetize this? What are they actually trying to do? Uh, get more followers on their original account, and then they do commercials for, you know, Manscaped and um, and Blue Chew or no? I no, that's funny. Actually, I think um, I don't know exactly how it works, but it would screw up what all of this the, the one community I'm talking about right now, which is the, which is what I will call the Rick Lax collective for Uh lack of a, and I don't know how organized this group is. I know for a fact that there are people who are directly paid by Rick Lax. Again, Vegas area comedian, or comedian, Vegas area magician, Rick Lax, (laughs) and a group of other magicians and magician's assistants that he knows that make these videos. And then they also hire people to make, they'll like pay people to like go out one day and just film a bunch of viral stunts at a gas station somewhere, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, What they do I believe Rick Lax used to do videos on Facebook all the time where he would say, hi, I'm Rick Lax and here's how, here's a magic trick and here's how it's done. He doesn't do that anymore. All of them sort of have this anonymous character when they're in these videos where you're not quite sure, you know, are these two dating or are they married? You know, what's, what's the deal here? And they never say what their names are. They never explain who they are. It's all sort of done in this, Again, it's supposed to look like just a video that you found of two normal people. That's what it's supposed to look like. Right. Um, doing something doing something weird. And they just happen to decide that they're going to, like, change the color of their shirts using, like, cereal or something. Like, cereal exactly. or like, Or M&Ms or Steelers or something. tie-dye their shirts. And so they're, like, taking shirts off, but not fully naked. And, and they get these trends from TikTok a lot of the time, where it's like, if it's one of these things where you're, 
changing the color of your bikini with smoke bombs or something. Yes, those that, are that things. Was, those are things that take off on that's TikTok. A, so that's an actual one that you yeah. people would <laughs> you know put like a colored smoke bomb in a Tupperware to show that like it would change yeah the color of their swimsuit or something. But it was obviously right. fake. But on TikTok, they'll like speed the video up. It'll be 20 seconds long. It'll be a little snappy. It'll make, you know, it'll be, there'll be some fun music or whatever. On Facebook, what they do is they have to drag it out over three minutes. Okay. So they, so they stand there and they hold the thing and they go, oh, look, it's working. And they have to, they have to <laughs> pretend to be so, that's one of the funniest things about this art form is that everyone in it, because simply because of that three minute time requirement, everyone in it has to act so much dumber than they okay. than they even are and that and, and that like, sort of lends it sort of the porn like tinge to oh it yeah also, sure of like yeah that sort of weird personality where you're yeah, like sort of like a Ooh, are you really gonna do that you know yeah like yeah that, yeah, yeah. that okay that's fascinating like the three minute thing I, uh, that's the, the three minute thing is yeah. huge it's such a big <laughs> part of the whole style of and these so, so what about another sort of related genre that you would clip from are these animated things that seem like they come from turkey or something oh yeah yeah it's like the, these stories like these long said. sort of soap opera stories about a woman whose husband died and then she remarried and it's it's obviously like broken translated english or something what is <laughs> I mean, that's... oh man i wish I, I wish i knew more about what how those came to be um the uh, to, to finish one thought real quick just about the the rick lax collective again was like you you would ask me what they what they do for money and i'm just I, my point there was they and sorry i i, I can go in a million directions with this stuff because i find <laughs> i find it very interesting obviously but uh like i think it would ruin it's funny because i think it would ruin the content that they're creating it would ruin their algorithmic status if they started going at the end of the video, like, by the way, this was brought to you by, you know, Lay's potato chips or whatever, you know, like, right. I think it would screw up what they're doing. So they have to sort of like sneak products in. And I don't know if anybody's paying them to sneak products in. I have a feeling they are, but I don't know if they are. But th they do get paid by the view. I think that they strictly get paid by the amount of views that they are able to generate. But it paid um, by who and for what? I, mean, I think it's like, I think it's Facebook monetization. I think if you that's again the three minute thing just is just running little like ads, you know, like cheapo. Oh ads yeah, Facebook runs ads so. during the during the videos. Facebook okay. does run ads like during these videos. And um, okay, so back to sorry, sorry, I, I just wanted to clear that. No, up no, because that's it, that's helpful because it is it is again critical to understanding why they're doing this. <laughs> is that they is that these guys are probably making more money now making making uh, uh, what what many would call awful unwatchable content uh what i what i call content that i love uh ma making this content they are they are making more money than they may have made as magicians i believe um well i mean it's hard, i assume it's hard to make a living as a magician so in some ways it's sort of like yeah you know you i mean do... these are successful guys i mean they're they're like they they are the Two, two of the biggest guys in this collective that I'm talking about, Rick Lax and Justin Flom, are like, they're magicians that like have been on, oh, uh, I know Justin Flom has been on like James Corden. Like they've been on like Tonight Show type. Okay. They've done like those <laughs> kinds of gigs. Like they're, okay. they're and they're, they have, you know, residencies in Vegas and shit like that. Okay. Stuff like that. Okay. Um, but anyway, the, and, and I think that these videos really started to take off when they weren't able to work during the pandemic. That's another aspect. Oh, okay. Of that, Interesting. That, is that factors in is that these guys would have been touring and and doing like regular shows okay. up until the pandemic um okay so the, as the animated things i don't i don't really know where those come from there's a site that is all over instagram uh all over facebook all over um i, I assume they have tiktok but youtube as well but there's a one company called fabiosa and fabiosa does all kinds of things they do like those you've seen like five minute hack videos or five minute crafts videos like montage videos of like life hacks and stuff uh -huh. like that that's pretty much like those are all over the place those are all over youtube and all over facebook but fabiosa does those kinds of things they also do the animated videos which i believe are just like someone has a, a connection to one of those animation houses somewhere in some foreign country where they can get cheap animation done flash animation kind of and it's yeah very seems like um homestar runner kind of yeah 
and the idea is you just plug the story in and they make a they make an animation out of it and there's a an account called and, and both of these accounts have like all of these sub accounts and they have a, an account for every country and then they have an account that's just montages of people getting different hairstyles but then they also have the one that's animation and the fabiosa animation one is very funny because their animators are they're so the videos are so colorful and the stories are so complicated but it basically <laughs> feels like someone email forwarded a crazy story about someone that they knew who uh you know who married a guy who turned out to not be who he said he was or uh or there was one recently that i really like where a guy got really obsessed with uh vr and a roomba and the video makes it look like he turned his roomba into his new girlfriend through <laughs> vr <laughs> And she ends up like dumping him and he runs out of money. All of these videos end up with the villain of the video, like eating out of the garbage because they screwed their life up so bad. Right. And there are all these little moral stories. Yeah. It did usually it is about sort of like a morality tale or like a chick tract or something. It, it was exactly. a religious aspect to it of like a woman was abused by the world and men and then, but she held fast and then, you know, she was rewarded with a wealthy husband or something. It, it's yeah. And they usually have sort of, they have conservative like family roles and stuff like they're enforcing in them and stuff they it, yeah they're like old-fashioned morality parables but told very like told very breathlessly and very sort of uh and very intensely with these intense music scores and then this absolutely bonkers animation that is very <laughs> that is very fun to me so those are, I mean, those are, again, those are very easy things to find, like the Rick Lax videos. It, it, just Google Fabiosa, Google Ammo Mama. Those two are probably the biggest ones that that consistently make animated stuff that I like. Okay, so all this stuff is sort of like the weird, like, effluvia or cast-off bits of internet garbage. Like, there's already so much garbage on the internet, and then this is like, yeah. I don't know, it's like people are creating garbage like there's accidental garbage stuff that people create on the internet that they think is good, but it turns out is very bad. And then sometimes that goes viral for people making fun of it. And this is sort of like they're creating stuff that they know is not good in any way, I assume, but it somehow plugs into some weird combination of the algorithm and human curiosity, et cetera, to just keep you watching or clicking. And so it's a little bit like, uh, those ads that are on the bottom of a lot of websites from one site is called Taboola that runs them. It'll be like mixed in and sort of looks like it's an actual, a link to an actual news article perhaps, but it'll be something right. about like, you won't believe what this actor from Hee Haw looks like now or sure. a child actor, what they look like now or some, or there's all this weird stuff about gut health. And I guess there's right. a lot of Americans who have trouble you know, moving their bowels in the morning. And so it's like this one, right. the one food that this cancer the doctor one trick. says. It's like so, a picture of an almond on fire. And it says the one trick to clear your bowels. Yeah, or just, or, or like a, like some eggs and like submerged in like what looks like milk or something. It's very, it's strange. But also I assume they are constantly running, you know, like AB testing on the stuff to try to figure out what people click on and what they don't. And so it seems like people actually do want to find out what this star of Hee Haw you know, looks like now that you'll never believe right. or else they would try something else. And so, but this, and so this is like a it's sort of a further version of that, of like <laughs> some sort of sick revealed preference of well, and they do, and they do want to watch. They absolutely do the same. They, they use sort of the same principles where, um, you know, you want to have a very striking image for the beginning of the video. You want the video to like start with, I don't know, like, um, there've been a lot recently where it's like a, a woman in like exercise clothes or like very like form fitting clothes sort of squatting and a friend is holding a banana like right in front of her there. I've seen a ton of those lately. And it's like, and the, the obvious like sexual, like innuendo of that, like it makes people, it draws people's attention to it. And so there's a ton of them that just, they start like that and then they go on for 12 minutes or something. And they do a bunch of different shit in the video, but all that really matters is that first image that gets people to click on the video, right? right. So it's very similar to those kinds of paid advertisements on on websites. Yeah. So, okay. So the, so you were cataloging this strange world and, and sort of doing like a mashup thing. And sometimes there were like, you would include like a intro song that was like, oh, yeah, fleet, yeah. fleet, 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 fleet. So, so I, and 
you would like post them daily. And then since, you know, who knows why Twitter makes whatever decision it made, they decided to discontinue fleets. And, yeah. and so this project was forced to at least end in, in that form. And, but you're still ugly, but how are, <laughs> so it, it, that initial purity of it can no longer exist, but how are you continuing now? Yeah. So what happened with that was, um, did they get rid of, I'm trying to think if they suspended me before they got rid of fleets <laughs> or if they got rid of fleets before they suspended me. I don't know. But, um, those two things happened, which, which affected, affected me, you know? Uh, oh no, I know they did. They did suspend me before they got rid of fleets because I ended up making an account that was just for fleets. Yes. Yes. I remember. So I have, uh, I have a, an account called fleets. Good. And it's you can still get fleets, even though you're not allowed, even though they've been uh, they've been outlawed on the actual uh, website. And then so I made I made that account and then they and then they got rid of fleets. It was a rough year for me. Twenty twenty one. Like they really Twitter just decided to just keep digging me lower and lower and lower down <laughs> into the dirt, spitting on me more and more and more. So when they got rid of fleets, I started tried out a few different things i tried just sort of posting videos i didn't really like that because that just felt like i mean everybody does that and again it's not like i'm it, it's not like i'm doing some you know intense cultural archaeology here i am really just going over to the facebook watch tab <laughs> and finding the weirdest things that i that i see immediately so then i started doing so i i did like a few little compilations where i would find like a trend that people were doing and I would cut those into like a little two minute, 20 second compilation of some weird trend that I saw across multiple videos. And then I started doing like a, a sort of a version of the fleet's stories where it's an edited together sort of montage of the funniest moments of each of these things. And that I think was kind of like a fun project, but I simply do not have enough time to do it. <laughs> I don't have enough time to like, make a I, I think I, for a while there i was doing it every other day or every day or something like that i really do not have enough time to to edit together you know a a, a montage of the weirdest moments of that day's fleets or whatever no i mean yeah this i mean that would be a full-time job which is on its own so eventually i decided well we might as well since the since the thing that was cool about this to me to start with was the idea that we were sort of all watching this content together i decided to do a stream on my twitch stream that's usually during the day and it sort of depends on whether i have time to do it but it's the the fleet stream on the big howl possum twitch stream and it's usually like around four o'clock in the afternoon on a given uh monday or friday or sometimes wednesday i will just do like an hour and a half of just we just watch the videos together. We just watch like <laughs> whatever's trending on. I mean, I, I try to get a good mix of things. So it's not just, it's not just like, oh, I open my Facebook watch tab and we just scroll through it. So I, mm -hmm. I, I try to curate a nice blend of a variety of things. So there'll be a couple of the animation things that, that we talked about. There'll be some life hack videos. <laughs> there'll be uh, several of these Rick Lax things that I was talking about. Yeah, and there's a couple other like little characters that I tend to like. Then there's this woman down in Mississippi who <laughs> who has a she has a mastiff. She has this big dog named Hogan. Oh and yes, she, yes. And she loves to send out messages to her Facebook followers by speaking into her phone and, and doing using one of those apps that animates your pet's face so that it's like Hogan is speaking. But it's, <laughs> they're so good. They're really really good. <laughs> So it's just basically this this older lady down in Mississippi expressing herself through the face of her dog every day in like a <laughs> two minute video, roughly. And she's wonderful. Like there's not there's nothing wrong with like what she's doing or there's nothing cynical about what she's doing. But it's very, very funny. And she's not doing it for money. But it's very, very funny that it's like uh, it'll be like here. Here, my dog has some here my dog has something to say about uh bullying online or something like that you know it's uh but <laughs> but she does this really high-pitched voice yeah it's sort of like alvin and the chipmunks or something so there's like a bunch of there's sort of a rotating cast of characters that i just happen to like a lot that's what fleets has sort of become 
Okay. That in the that in the theme song that you mentioned earlier. Like it's anything that I anything that I feel matches up well with just my voice going flutes, 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 flutes. Okay, well, I'm glad the project lives on. And yeah, the part of like so the woman with Hogan, it, it, it's sort of like some modern version of like outsider art or something. It's like just this Yeah. You know, oh, strange yeah. creative individual who is doing their own thing. Whereas you have sort of like the sinister version of it, of the people who are, you know, making these long videos with no payoff just so they can run Facebook ads. And so, yeah, so it's all, it's all mixed up. And um, yeah, well, it's all mixed up. Something you could say about everything. I think <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. I have no um, well grander conclusion to draw than that, but we've been going for a while. So maybe we should wrap things up there, but sure. can you, We'll include the links in the podcast description to your work, but where, if people just want to find you in general, how can they do so? Well, I mean, I generally link to anything I do through my Twitter account, which is just at Howl Dotty, H O W E double L D A W D Y. Um, at Howl Dotty, I will, I will probably, I, I post about when I go live on, on Twitch. And I also post about if I put out songs or albums or, you know, Hal Dottie's Fast Track comes out this week. The the new season, uh, I've, got a, I've got a second season of uh, Hal Dottie's Fast Track coming out this Friday, April 8th. And um, the album of the volume one songs should be at least up on Bandcamp by the time that that first episode comes out. It might take a little longer for it to hit the streaming sites because it, just takes longer when you okay so you put it. together an album of the songs of the songs for, yeah there were 20 episodes in season one last year and so there's a 20 uh, song album that cool. is coming out and let's see there are three bonus episodes a month of fast track uh, all year round if you decide you want to support the show over at the patreon which is patreon.com slash howl and that is at the five dollar a month level you get three bonus episodes you get free downloads of the songs that i just mentioned uh, the song the original songs that we write on the show and then also access to uh, discord uh where we can hang out <laughs> and then uh i have a radio show every monday night at uh, on the uh, on the local station here uh, wfpk louisville kentucky um it's called the big howl and possum radio hour and it's a comedy show with music sort of mixed in and then we also, Big Hal and Possum also have a podcast that comes out every Thursday afternoon. We've just recently started doing that. And uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's about everything. I mean, that, that is a lot. You're, that's you're a putting lot. out as much as some of these, you know, like content farms that, you know, have like dozens of people making videos about changing the color of your bathing suit using bananas or something. And you're just you know, one with some collaborators uh, sometimes. So it's, it's quite impressive. <laughs> and um... <laughs> I don't know if impressive is the word, <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I will say this as, as a, as a conclusion, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to drag this out for a long time, but every once in a while, I will think about the fact uh, when I was in my early twenties, I was a musician. I liked doing comedy and I liked making comedy videos. And I remember I was out hiking in the woods one day and I, I said to myself, like, you know, I don't care what else happens. I don't care how much money I make in my life. I just want to make music and I want to make videos. I want to make, like, I want to make stuff that's funny or musical or whatever. I want to make things. I want to die having made a bunch of stuff. And at the time, it felt like, at the time, it was a, I was at a time where a bunch of my friends were like settling down and like getting real jobs and stuff like that. At the time, it felt like I was making this real statement to myself, like a like real noble sort of like, like artists mission you know like i was i was doing this i was like it doesn't matter i will I, I will work any job i can that that leaves me open to make stuff and it's funny looking back on that now because it, we because we are such a content drenched society that it was as if i was you know knighting myself with a sword and saying i shall be a content creator it was as if i it's I, I took it very seriously at the time. And it's a moment that has meant a lot to me in my life, but it's like so fucking funny looking back on it now and knowing what, like knowing how sort of uh, how, how desperate for attention and how, how like how we we've all sort of turned ourselves into content farms. 
like looking back on that moment, it's very funny and mixed to me now because it's like, yeah, everybody's everybody's doing the shit, the shit I'm doing. <laughs> well, I think at least in your case, it comes from a place of purity as much as one can. In this- I want to make good, I want to make good stuff, but uh, but I also I also know how great bad stuff is. I love bad <laughs> stuff, so it's like it's I don't know. It's I'm I'm a mess, man. I'm a mess. <laughs> no, you're you're taking you're taking this like crap you know uh, it, well in various ways you're you're taking stuff that is sort of like junk of the internet and you know re <laughs> reframing it or repurposing it <laughs> in a a more i don't know a more enjoyable more positive way and you're not just trying to um fool people into staying you know watching for three minutes so another facebook ad can be served or whatever <laughs> whatever the fuck yeah these people are doing so i think that you know that that I don't know. I need I need money. Contact. I need money. Yes, and and, (laughs) you know, may hopefully you won't turn your powers to to evil (laughs) by like switching teams and you know starting your own, right? Getting something some magicians and starting your own um content studio or whatever. Um, Yeah. Okay. Why don't we (laughs) Why don't we end things there? So sure. So thanks for taking the time. It's been uh, interesting talking to you. I'm a obviously a, a fan and admirer of your work. Uh, people should yeah, check it you. out and they can, you know, rate and review the show. They can follow me, uh, A-R-Y-H-C-W and um, tell your friends, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, Hal. Thank you to our listeners and we'll see you again next time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. This was fun.